Welcome guys to our second video in our XMPP core series. And in this one, we're going to talk about the architecture of XMPP. In the last video, we looked at the steps a client goes through to be able to connect to the server and they are outlined here. Now we are more interested in the architecture aspects and the primitives that really make XMPP work. And we're going to look at that. The XMPP architecture really looks like this. You have a bunch of clients and servers that are connected to each other. XMPP allows a synchronous end-to-end -end exchange of structured data. It is end-to-end -end because, for example, user1 at server1.com can send a message to user2 at server2. And uh, it's like there's a pipe that takes messages from one node to another and uh, messages go through there that's why it's called end to end and the synchronous means it's a kind of fire and forget mechanism you push the message out there and they can receive it at their own time for example you can send it when they are not online and when they come online the server pushes the message to them this is what is meant by a synchronous xmpp uses xml under the hood it is a bunch of XML tags that we are really exchanging in XMPP. It is a client to server architecture. You have a clients and servers, for example, here, you see a bunch of clients and servers in the middle. And now we're going to look at XMPP addressing. How does the addresses in XMPP look? How do they work? A client in XMPP has an address that looks like uh, an email. If you look here, we have user1 at server1.com. So this is, uh, this is an address in XMPP. Okay, as you see here, all XMPP entities are addressable on the network. That's how we are able to send a message from point one to point two. XMPP client addresses look like emails. You have username at server. And you see that we have a slash resource here. What does this mean? A resource is used to kind of flag a device that the user is using to connect to their server. If you look here, we have user1 at server1.com, but on this feature phone here, you see it's also user1 and server1.com. So it is the same account that is connecting from multiple devices, okay? And we use this resource part to kind of identify the device the user is using. So this is what the resource is used for in XMPP. And if you look back on the slide on the steps, needed to connect to the server. The last step in being able to connect to the server is uh, binding a resource to a stream that you open to your XMPP server. So resources are very important in allowing us to differentiate between different streams from a single XMPP address. Okay, now we've looked at the addresses of clients. How do server addresses look like? Well. The server address is really this part here, the domain part. The part at the right of this at symbol is really the address of your XMPP servers. So you see a user saying, okay, my XMPP server is hosted at example.com, server7.com and things like that. A takeaway from this slide really is uh, XMPP clients have addresses, XMPP servers have addresses. An address in XMPP for a client looks like an email. Think something like user at server.com and servers have addresses too. The, their addresses are the domain part in an XMPP address. You will also see XMPP addresses called Jabber IDs or abbreviated GIDs in the XMPP terminology. So you should know that a GID is just an XMPP address. Everything I'm saying here is not out of the blue. It is defined in this RFC document. You can visit it and see how really they define XMPP addresses. It is RFC 6122. Okay, now that we know how addresses work in XMPP, let's look at presence. Presence is really a way for an XMPP entity to advertise its online or offline status. This online status is communicated using an XMPP primitive that we call a present stanza. Okay, so we have multiple types of uh, communication primitives in XMPP, and we're going to have a chance to look at that in the future. For now, you should keep in mind that uh, online status information is propagated through the XMPP network using a communication primitive of XMPP that we call a presence stanza. 
presence is covered in uh, a separate RFC document that you see here, RFC 6121. And uh, you can go look at it and see how it works. Now we look at stanzas. In the previous slide, I just said that we use presence to propagate online status information and we use a presence stanza. So what is a stanza? A stanza is the most basic unit of communication in XMPP. It is the smallest thing you can send over the XMPP network. It is an XML tag, you know, that XMPP uses XML under the hood. And the stanza has a bunch of attributes inside. These are XML attributes. And we use some of those attributes to route stanzas. The most common attributes you will see are the from attribute that says where the stanza is coming from, the to attribute uh, to denote where the stanza is going. Inside the stanza, we can have a bunch of other tags that kind of identify what kind of information we're trying to send to the destination. Okay, this is what a stanza is. We're going to look at them in the future, but for now know that it is the smallest thing you can send over the XMPP network. If you know something about computer networking, it's like a packet. Okay, now that we know about the addresses in XMPP and the stanzas, there's a point I'd like to emphasize, and uh, that is that XMPP is a distributed network of clients and servers. And this brings up the point we call federation in XMPP. So what is federation? Federation is the capability of two servers that have been set up independently to be able to communicate. Let's say server one is in country A and server three is in country B. And they have been built independently. But in XMPP, these two servers can communicate. If the admins of these two servers allow them to communicate, they can communicate without any further action required because XMPP is a standard and these two servers are following that standard. I hope this makes sense. Although XMPP allows this, you see companies that deploy XMPP enforce different policies. For example, there are a lot of spammy servers there that are there just to send spam messages to others. And you see that many people block these kind of servers. XMPP allows us to communicate, but it also gives us the flexibility of stopping communication with whoever we don't want to communicate to. And many servers allow this through some kind of access control lists or things like that. Okay, now that we know that XMPP works on top of the client server architecture, I'd like to emphasize on the responsibilities of a client. A client has to start the first step in uh, establishing the XML stream with the server by authenticating using the credentials of a registered account. So for example, my account is user at server.com. I go in my XMPP client, I put my credentials. When I hit the login button, the client has to start the stream negotiation process. Okay, this is what they mean here. The client also has to complete the resource binding in order to enable the delivery of XML stanzas. Okay, so a client has to go through all these steps to be able to start sending messages. An XMPP client also has to use XMPP to communicate with this server. When you have completed resource binding, you can start sending messages to any XMPP node on the network. And by now we know that multiple clients can connect to an XMPP server using at the same account. Okay, you can connect from your computer, from your mobile phone, and whatever device that you have. And XMPP allows that. And each client is uh, differentiated by the resource part of the XMPP address. So we just saw that. Okay, so this is mainly what a client in XMPP is responsible for. So what are the responsibilities for a server? Well, a server manages streams with connected clients and it delivers XML stanzas to other clients over the negotiated stream. A server is also responsible for allowing the communication with other servers. For example, if this client on server one sends a message to a client on server two, server one is responsible of detecting that the message is going to another server, and then it relays that message to another server for delivery to the connected client. And this covers what we had to say in this video about the XMPP architecture. 
you should now have a very good idea of how XMPP is put together. You now know about the addresses in XMPP. A client has an address like this. The server has an address like this. We usually send stanzas over the XMPP network. You know about the responsibilities of a client. You know about the responsibilities of the server. And all we've just talked about in this video is really covered in point two on the RFC 6120 document. So if you go there, they talk about the XMPP architecture, and this is all we just talked about. So you can go and read about this if you are in the mood for that. And if you are in the mood for reading other materials about the introduction of XMPP, you can have a look at this tutorial of mine here. The link is also going to be shared in the description below. And as usual, if you want to read more about XMPP, you can visit our website, blycontech.com. Visit our blog. You're going to have a lot of material to read about XMPP. And also you can go to our products page and see some of the video courses we have on XMPP. We currently have a complete course to build a chat app on Android that can send messages and files. You can take the entire bundle of the course where you have access to these two courses, or you can take a separate course and uh, see what works for you. And also, please remember, you can come to our newsletter here and subscribe, and you're going to be notified every time we publish something new. And uh, on occasion, we also publish discounts on our courses, and you don't want to miss on that. So please subscribe here and you'll be notified. Okay, that's all I had to say today. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one.